Hey, we're live. Let's do the intro video here. Marketing Power Ups. Ready? Go! Here's your host, Rebelly John. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming here. We are the first ever Super Smash marketers. <laughs> we have your Kevin and Eli. How are you both doing? How are things with you on, on your end? Great. Doing well, uh, Kevin always tries to speak first, so it's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> go, 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 go. <laughs> I cut you off. No, I'm, doing, I'm doing well. Great. Thanks for having us, Raleigh. We're good. We're good. You, uh, for you in the audience, uh, there's, you know, like an inside joke that, you know, I often jump ahead and then Eli cuts me off. So uh, this time Eli jumped ahead and then I missed my chance to cut him off. So I'm still practicing. <laughs> That's like in Kalamazoo. <laughs> I like it. Thank you so much. I know people are just joining in. Uh, if y'all can type in the chat, uh, you know, we're live on YouTube. We're also live on LinkedIn. So I'd love to hear where everybody's tuning in from us. People are stri strickling in. Uh, but how, like, what's what's new for you, both of you, before, you know, um, I guess let's, what's, what are you consume? what kind of content are you consuming right now? Maybe it's a book, maybe it's a podcast. Uh, let's start, let, well, Let's start with Eli. <laughs> Go ahead. Like, what are you like reading right now, or like book, or as people are tuning in? Uh, yeah, exactly what you're. What you're I'm reading everything I can on AI. I don't know. It's just it seems to be like the topic of the day. I just read a it's a best selling book on Amazon. What is ChatGPT by Wolfram Stephen Wolfram, and it is so helpful. Like, I think everyone like talks about AI and like says AI and it's, it sounds fancy, but like you read this book, it, to be honest, like I understood about like 80% of it, but I feel so much more knowledgeable about what we're even dealing with. Like this concept of an LLM, a large language model is not even that complicated compared to like Tesla's AI driving down the road, not killing people. Like that's AI. Like a lot of other stuff is AI, like content being written out by Google, by ChatGPT, not that complicated once you read this thing. So just really, really trying to absorb anything I can in AI because I actually want to understand it and be knowledgeable about it. So many people are just like repeating stuff like AI is going to take over the world. Like it already took over the world. Like this, all these things that are happening is just a step change. And, you know, last year, was, you know, we get more of a look under the hood, but it's not like planes were flying by pilots before. They were using AI and autopilot. And it's not like, you know, cars were driving, were not driving by themselves before. Like even, uh, you know, I don't have a Tesla, but like my car has like forward crash detection. That is using artificial intelligence to tell me that I'm about to hit someone because I'm on my phone. I'm not, sorry, not on my phone. I wouldn't do that. I would never do that. But that kind of thing. So I'm uh, really absorbing everything I can about AI so I can understand it better and you know, be a more knowledgeable marketer. I will check out that book. Thank you for sharing that, Eli. And Kevin, what are you what are you up to? What are you reading? What are you checking out? What video are you MKHD or like something else? Yeah, MKBHD is pretty cool. I watch most videos. I'm I'm also just simply fascinated by their production quality and how he does that. Um, but right now I'm reading a book called The Copywriter's oh. Handbook. It's, okay. it's it's live here. It's a paper book uh, for everybody who cannot see that. <laughs> and uh, I really want to step up my copywriting skills because I think it there is a important transfer lesson that that is applicable to AI as well. And that is how to capture human attention. Uh, I find copywriting is basically a, a, a systematic approach or a recipe for capturing attention and leading to an action. And AI, by definition, is the automation of things. And the more we automate, I think the more important it is to send out in some way. So trying to sharpen my copywriting skills but um just like you know like eli I'm, I'm trying to consume as much about ai as possible and of course use ai tools as much as possible oh uh Ramli, i think you're you're muted we're, we're missing the sound oh thank you appreciate that yeah thank, thank you for sharing that i appreciate it uh for everybody else tuning in i saw some folks from toronto from india from finland from Germany, uh, as people, we're gonna get this also live on YouTube later on. So I uh, thank you for everybody watching. Like I mentioned, this is the first ever Super Smash Marketers. So uh, what we're gonna do, we have three rounds. We're gonna be talking about three different things, but we have here Kevin, who's gonna be talking about how uh, AI is really like a game changer for SEO and content. While Eli's more 
obviously it's very contrarian. <laughs> and it's going to say... my mind. No, game changer. <laughs> Kevin's got to switch teams now. <laughs> That's funny. How it's, you know, a little bit overrated. People are talking about it. But, you know, I'm curious uh, how that... There's been a lot of changes since we actually scheduled this a month ago. But we're going to start off with an introduction. Uh, you are, will have a chance to do your... Er, intro verbiage before we get into the the three rounds while everybody else here if you have any questions feel free to drop it in the chat i can actually show it up uh on the screen so let's start with our introduction uh let's start off with uh kevin uh and chat a little bit about why you think ai will definitely change the landscape for uh for content and seo and then we'll switch over to eli yeah i'll make a couple of points i'm, I'm going to try not to ramble on for too long but First of all, I think AI might be the biggest invention of humanity, period. Second, it enables, it opens completely new doors, not just of giving better answers in search, but for humans to interact with the search results. And that really is the first time that we see this beyond clicks or maybe engaging with a, a calculator, right? But now there's a completely new world of context and, and signals that Google can gather. And uh, you know, I think I think it's 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 gonna make it harder for us to measure the feedback of our changes, and at the same time, it might it might allow us to to truly, uh, you know, uh, capture a lot more traffic potentially by showing up in some of these early search uh, uh, or generative uh, um, uh, generative AI search exp uh, results. So. Again, a lot that we don't know yet, but in my mind, AI brings search to a new level. Some some bad things for SEOs, some good things for SEOs, uh, and I'm just you know I'm just excited that things change again because for the last ten plus years it was pretty you know we we're optimizing the last two to three percent, and now because there's so much movement, there's a lot more room for for you know reverse engineering things and figuring out how things work and getting a, an advantage. Awesome, thank you, Kevin. Eli, let's let's start with you with your introduction about why you think uh, it might be a little overrated. Everybody's talking about it. You know, that's it's uh, it's it, I'm not I wouldn't say it's a fad, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, your on AI and SEO and content. So I'm I'm converted. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Does it mean I win? You win, Kevin. Win. <laughs> when when ChatGPT first came out, I, I felt like it was more of a toy. Like people were using it to write content that wasn't great, and people were using it to like look up things which were kind of interesting. But you already found these responses in Google, and you already found it on real websites. the The difference for me is when people started using ChatGPT as search to discover new information, and when I started hearing people say, "Oh, I don't use Google Search anymore. I only go to ChatGPT," or <laughs> Um, as I heard someone say like their daughter's doing this college research paper and she does not use Google anymore. She only uses ChatGPT. That's when things started changing for me, that there is a lot of knowledge here. Again, like tons of complaints initially, like, oh, plagiarized all the content. So my thing was like, well, it's not necessarily accurate. Go to the original source. But then it got better and started getting better content. And it didn't really plagiarize it. It created new content out of all the sources. And then I think Google took notice. So initially, Google's like, oh, we can do this thing, too. Here's Bard. It's a toy, right? They launched in a couple of days because they already had all this stuff under the hood. But then Google started freaking out and the market started freaking out. And they've integrated not Bard, but a new generative experience, or actually different data sets, if you compare them, into regular Google search. And I think this is the biggest thing that will ever happen for SEO. And it's for sure the biggest thing that, that has happened to date for SEO. And, you know, it, does, it hasn't really rolled out right now. The only people using generative experiences are those that opted into labs, which is a very small fraction of nerds like us who are like, oh, we really want to see what the new Google is, but the rest of the world is not using this. But Google has taken notice. Like Google has heard people, and I'm sure there are people at Google where there are Googlers that probably don't use Google. They only use ChatGPT now, and Google has taken notice, and they're for, they're freaking out. So they're, they're doing this, and they're going to change results, even if it's not great, even if users don't like these kinds of things, they're still going to launch it. And now I don't think it's a toy. Now I think this is real and it will change everything about traffic because SEO has typically been top of funnel traffic. Mm. And now it's gonna to move to mid funnel where you're now going to get the top of funnel from generative experiences. Google's gonna give up some revenue, but also gonna gobble a lot more revenue. So if you look at queries like Miami hotels, that is now generative, that's a generative response, at least for those opted into labs. 
but the links within the, the response is linking over to Google's hotels pages. So they're getting more revenue like that. So they've completely disrupted the top of funnel on something like TripAdvisor, but brought it to themselves. So I think this is the biggest game changer that has ever happened in SEO and will be the biggest game changer to happen in SEO. And you have a lot of people that are like, you know, saying it's not because it affects their livelihoods. It affects the way we do things. But again, the reality is it is, and you have to adopt it. You can't really cling to the past. So, sorry, I've converted completely to, <laughs> uh, we, we can end right now because <laughs> they have nothing left to debate. <laughs> That's funny. You made some really interesting points on how, like, it might be uh, a little, uh, you know, uh, it will it will destroy search. <laughs> and then we do have a question that we'll I'll bring up later, like, the, that we'll get into the feature of search per se. But I want to dig into, the you know, the first of three rounds. We're going to be talking about SEO content uh, and the quality of it. I know in your show, you had a sh uh, you chatted about how, uh, in the contrarian marketing podcast, how you know it's often uh, you'll see because of AI, you probably will see more and more content, and most of that will be bad or good. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how SEO content will need to change to adapt to to this new world. Uh, and I believe I started with Kevin, so Eli, you got the first floor, so that we we make sure we have an equal footing here. Eli, what's your thoughts on that? What's your thoughts on SEO and content and how um, will will it get worse? Will it be like race to the bottom? <laughs> yeah. We'll have worse and worse content. And how do you how do you really like stand out with your content? To so we, we already had a race to the bottom. I, I think that's where we've been for a very long time. And, you know, it started with, again, a lot of these things aren't new. Years ago, this is probably uh, pre-Panda. So 14 years ago, there was a WordPress plugin called Caffeinated Content. All right, Kevin probably ever heard of it? Google it. It still exists. So what caffeinated content is, is you took RSS feeds and you put it into this WordPress plugin and then it used some sort of dictionary and it created synonyms. So it took like RSS feeds, it mashed up content and then it spun synonyms in there. So you put in the word car and it changed it to vehicle. You put in a restaurant and change it to cafeteria. You're like garbage in, garbage out, right? That, I'm sure it still exists, but like that's, that's, chat gpt like that is like the the toddler version of chat gpt uh content so like bad content has always existed you have so many people on upwork like put in seo content so many people on, on upwork are going to write content for five dollars so ai content really doesn't change much it is using a tool to make the production of bad content cheaper now to write good content I think AI content writers, now that's a tool to help you sort of research and come up with ideas. And then a good writer will formulate ideas on top of that. So I think we were already going very, very far down this terrible slide to begin with. And now we have accelerated it even more because it's become easier and, of course, cheaper. You don't really need to pay much for the content to be created. Now, where does it go in the future? I think users were already not trusting this kind of content. Like, for example, if you're looking for a dentist, most dentist websites have like this garbage content on like how to brush your teeth and how to floss and all that useless, right? Like you don't, no dentist is going to rank on that kind of content. You go to restaurants and like they'll have tons of useless content. A lot of it could be written by AI, written by freelancers and Upwork. Again, users don't care for this at, at all. What users like is real original content. So the same way the newspaper industry, you know, pre, I don't know, 15 years ago, for example, the newspaper industry, when you buy a newspaper, and it would have the Associated Press and it would have Reuters in it and you'd read the news. The newspapers figured out that their job wasn't to repackage news that they got from somewhere else and then deliver it to your doorstep because you didn't get it anywhere else. They figured out that their value add is creating original content. So I think that's where we are. Users don't care for this stuff. So great. You're using AI to write content. You know, that's not your value prop. You can't just spin out content just for the sake of content. So I don't think that much has changed there. The other thing that I, I saw this great tweet from uh, Nisim Talib, who we love talking about on our podcast. He, he called ChatGPT a self-licking lollipop. So essentially, the content, AI content feeds other AI content, and then like the crap just continues to flow on and on from there. So I, I think that the wrong question is like, where does SEO go with AI content? Like, It's just a tool to make terrible content worse. We shouldn't be going in that direction. Anyways, we should be writing content that is good for users regardless of how you've done it. Like you can use a someone on Fiverr or Upwork to write the content and then improve upon it. 
But if you're like a media organization that there are websites like this, I think they'll disappear because users don't like them. And they just, you know, with all this, you know, more intelligence and more analytics, they'll, they'll be gone. I love kind of Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go, go gonna... disagree with everything I said, Kevin. <laughs> I actually, I actually tried to dis- to interrupt Eli. Sorry. Uh, not go ahead. Go ahead. You, it. Do it. Uh, so I kind of disagree. I think in the short term we will see a you know a lot of trash content. You can already tell by by comments. So on LinkedIn, other forums. I recently um, you know uh, syndicated one of my articles from my blog to a popular platform or forum. I'm not going to say the name. Don't want to bash them, but uh, I got thirty comments within minutes they were all ai generated some of them even had oh i uh, sorry uh, i'm an ai i cannot say something about that and just, people just copy pasted that and blasted it in so i agree in the short term we're going to see this blast of trash from anything right social engagement blog comments etc however this is a top of mind problem for all big platforms and i think in the medium term we will see much less trash content the reason being actually two reasons one um, all the big platforms are now working on verifying accounts, right? But Twitter was a bit of a mess because of monetization and other reasons, and Elon just going crazy. But Facebook is doing this, or Meta is doing the same thing. Google has invested more in account verification, uh, very under the radar. And so they're all making sure that the users that they have are actual humans. Number two, AI works in both ways, right? So it, it allows us to create content at much faster scale and a lot more trash content, also great content, by the way. I want to point that out. But it also allows these platforms to identify users at a much, much faster rate, right? Like these linear regressions to help platforms identify which users are good or which are fake, um, that becomes much better with AI. And it also allows these big platforms to identify good sources of content much faster, right? So Google with their new, not new, but with their guidelines around EAT, et cetera, right? They really highlight experience and expertise. So they try to highlight specific authors. And it's actually not very complex for these platforms to develop algorithms that reward good sources of content with more visibility. It's very similar to what Google has tried for the last 20 years. So short term i'm bearish on content i think there's going to be a lot more trash medium to long term i actually think that these platforms will figure out much much better uh what good content is and how to how to bring it to the surface so i don't think that long term you can you can survive and and get good arbitrage with trash content from ai really 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 interesting point i love how you took a contrary point from eli so we do have a little bit of a, a debate here that there is uh you know there will be a lot of trash but the platform will definitely figure this out we got a few ch- uh, questions in the chat we'll, we'll get to that very shortly but i want to keep moving and talk about the second round which is the limitations of eli uh, i'm curious what your your thoughts on this because uh really in in that episode i, I keep bringing this up but for people who are uh, not subscribed to contrarian marketing podcasts there's this episode from a couple of months ago uh google bard still not as good as bing i'm not sure if you still agree with that i'm curious what your take us on that because this is a couple of months ago things have changed but you really talked about a few limitations uh of ai in this episode and i'm curious one of them is about emotion but uh can can you dig a little bit about the, that limitation that you, that uh that you you have brought up there or any other limitation you can see with AI, especially for SEO and content. And since Eli started the last one, let's start off with Kevin and then uh, Eli can disagree and uh, go contrarian against Kevin. <laughs> no, but, Kevin, what's your thoughts on this? What are the limitations of AI for SEO and content? <clears throat> yeah. So a couple. Um, and I, I once again want to distinguish between limitations we see today and mm-hmm. how, and whether these limitations will endure in the future. Um, so one is of course, hallucination, large language models basically making something up because there's no database behind these models. It's all based on statistical inference, right? So they're all, the basic way that LLMs work is they say, oh yeah, I've seen this a million times across the web. That must be the answer. And it works fairly well, but it it works surprisingly poorly for things like math and sometimes facts. However, uh, and I don't want to give Eli too much, uh, you know, food here to to contrarianize my statement but i also have to say that it is not it, we already search engines are 
grounding answers in search results, in classic search results, right? So there is there are ways to combine databases and generative AI answers to fact check generative AI. Uh, and so I think that that problem does not endure for long. I think that's very solvable. Um, what is not super easy to solve, and again, I think that's where there's an opportunity for SEO and marketing in general, are experience and expertise. You cannot recreate human experience, and it is very difficult to recreate human expertise, right? It's almost like that humans have a, a have an, some sort of an AI as well, but we're very bad at listening to it. And that's kind of our gut feeling, right? You, you often have these situations where somebody who's in a job for a very long time, think about a pilot who's been flying for 40 years or a doctor who's been practicing for, you know, like 30 years. They often operate after a system and checklists and stuff, but then sometimes their gut feeling tells them that something is off or sometimes their gut feeling tells them to go in a certain direction. And what that actually is, is their subconsciousness trying to bring up signals that they didn't consciously realize, right? So they subconsciously pick something up based on their training, they actually can, can pick up differences. And that, in my mind, is difficult for AI, especially for very complex, nuanced topics. So experience and expertise, very difficult to fake or to mimic for AI. And I think that's where there is a big opportunity. And then lastly... There is this big fear uh, of, you know, the AI doing things and making decisions without us understanding how the AI got there. And this transparency is a, is a basic loss of control. I don't think that holds true either. There is a concept that gains popularity called chain of thought prompting, where the AI will give you an answer and then tell you how it got there. And it's the same principle as the basic math test in high school, right? Where you know the answer, but the teacher will only give you full credit or full points uh, if you show the way of how you got there. And that's where AI is going to go as well. We're going to ask it stuff, and it's going to give us the right answer and then tell us how it got to that answer. And we'll learn from that, and it will allow us to correct that. So there are limitations, many limitations of AI that I don't think hold true in the future, but there are some that I have a hard time believing it will overcome, and that's mostly around experience and expertise, and that's where the opportunity for us is. Love it. Yeah, three, very succinct three uh, limitations. Eli, what's your thoughts? What are limitations? You you disagree with Kevin there? <laughs> I don't think, yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with Kevin. <laughs> I, I, think, I love uh, Kevin, the point Kevin made about the doctor and the, the nuance. So I'd say... Where AI, the advantage of AI in general, not just for SEO and content, is that it knows all knowledge or knows all written knowledge that it's been given. So it can be a much better doctor. I don't know if you've ever watched the show House MD. It was, ran for like 10 years on Fox. I love that show. Like the doctor always figured out what was going on because he had this great knowledge. So AI will be like that because it knows all knowledge and it doesn't miss facts, but the, it misses the nuance. Maybe there's a symptom that the patient isn't telling the doctor, but that a real human doctor can say, like, is your eye bothering you? Your eye looks like it, it might be itching. And like, that's not a symptom they thought. AI will never really know that unless it knows to ask that question. And again, it probably won't. Now, I think when it comes down to AI and SEO content, it's important, and this is where I want to go back to that book I referenced at the beginning of the show, the the you know book, the What is ChatGPT written by Wolfram, where he explained how ChatGPT comes up with content. So quick primer on this and what an LLM is, is it uses statistics to predict what the next word would be in a chain based on probability. So like the word what, what is most likely to come after the word what, but then it would be just stilted content be very boring. So it throws in some randoms in there. It's like, well, randomly it's gonna choose something with less statistical probability. And that's how you make content more interesting, but it's still not that interesting. So I'd say like the biggest limitation in AI content is that it's relying on statistics which means that all content is going to be perfectly average. It will never be above average because the above average content, obviously, is statistically rare. So we can't pick that. Now, it may arrive at great content. It may arrive at great solutions accidentally, but you can't predictably always be abnormal and always outside the norm. So that, I think, is its limitation. So great will always have to be human because, it, let's say, a great copywriter. You know, the av it, uh, AI learns from average. It learns how to be, do average copywriting to produce things. But you see, like, let's say on LinkedIn or Twitter, like, oh, wow, that's like a great tweet that really captured the moment or a great LinkedIn update that captured the moment. 
that is statistically rare. That comes from extreme talent on behalf of the human writer. And AI would see that, but recognize it as being rare, not recognize it as being good and wouldn't copy that. So I think that's the biggest limitation is you're using AI to just produce average. So we don't live in an average world. We don't want to live in an average world. And you know, if you just need to write content to write content, like to get the right answers, you can get the right answers. But if you want to produce something great, I don't think AI will ever do it. It's just like, yeah, can you can you go through life like, I don't know, drunk? Yes, you could probably go through life drunk. And don't drive or do anything like that's a danger to other people, but you can get through life drunk. Like you're not gonna have a great life if like you're always, you know, under the influence of something. So it's sort of a, not that AI is drunk, but it's sort of what AI is. It's like a blah, boring life. And it, if you want to like write just you know normal content, fill a website with thousands of pages of normal stuff, like, okay, good, that's your solution. If you want a great website, which has emotion, again, because emotion comes from, you can create either positive or negative emotion, but both those positive or negative are outside the norm, outside that bell curve. And that is why AI content really can't do that unless, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but like, I don't know how you statistically teach something to not trust statistics. That's so good uh living life drunk i mean that's, that's absolutely crazy just imagining that but i i just want to call out the book that you mentioned what is chat gpt doing why does it work paperback uh found it on amazon i also dropped the link to to that book so i'm going to be checking this out for sure but uh really great uh chat about this i want to jump into actually the the third round here around the future of seo and content Actually, we have a question about this that kind of fits right in. I'd love to get both of your takes here. Uh, and this is from Lee, Lee Evans. He's from YouTube. So if you have any questions, drop it in the chat. We can show it on the screen directly. It says, if your users can find their answers directly using AI, bypassing Google search, do we feel that the SERP will actually be obsolete in the future, rendering SEO obsolete? I believe you both have some opinions about this since Kevin started the last one. Let's let's start off with you. I'd love to get your your take on this uh, this question here. What's the future of SEO and content? Yeah, I never thought I'd say this, but I think SEO is dead. Okay. <laughs> Could turn it to Eli, no. No, it, it, good. Kevin will be fine. We know how to do more than SEO. We'll... <laughs> Not much. <laughs> I gotta change the name of my book and take out product led SEO. No, I, I think I, I, I think the SEO of 2022 is dead. The idea that you do a search and then you pick, you know, from the, the 10 best results or solutions to your problem, that that is no longer. I think for many things, SEO was an inefficiency. The concept of needing some layer in the middle to help translate what a user wanted. And what a website says into the search engine so the search engine finds it was essentially an inefficiency and that idea i think is eliminated with the with generative content because there are many things that the results will be just fine again it, right now it's it's beta so like i think the results will be wrong but let's say you want to know again the, the example i referenced earlier miami hotels right so Today, in today's paradigm, you search Miami hotels and you're going to find TripAdvisor and Kayak and Booking and, you know, Expedia and all those sites. And then you choose from which one of them to look at the exact same hotel. That's an inefficiency from a user perspective. Why can't I just get a list of Miami hotels? Now, it's not great, right? So you want to put in more in the prompt of say, I want a Miami hotel with beachfront access, with a pool and with balconies. And the AI will actually be able to take all the content, which is, doesn't belong to TripAdvisor, doesn't belong to Kayak, doesn't belong to Google, and tell you which hotel to go to. So the idea that you needed to go and do that Google search and one time click Kayak, next time click Kayak, Expedia to see the exact same hotels, that essentially was inefficiency that was solved by the SEO person at Expedia, that was solved by the SEO person at Kayak. We don't need, we won't need to do that with AI content, with generative responses. Now. Again, it's, it's wrong, right? So I want to go to Yosemite this summer and I looked for hotels near Yosemite and I was given hotels in San Jose. Like again, generative content needs to really improve. But that's that's the kind of thing where I think SEO changes. Now, where does SEO not change? I don't think you'll be able to do shopping in generative AI. I don't think you'll be able to buy SaaS products in generative AI. Mm -hmm. So where it really changes is SEO, you know, six months ago was top of funnel. I look for broad terms. I want to know best business bank and I looked, read a bunch of articles. Now I do generative AI, I say best business bank. The response might be, oh, the best business bank for you is, I don't know, Capital One. 
and then it spits out its Capital One. And then from there, I go to CapitalOne.com and I create an account and that's it. Again, that has that concept has all changed. You're now you're not going to write those articles. Same thing goes with mortgage rates. Like it's fascinating when you search mortgage rates. Google has general responses on that, which you know kind of upends their ads. And then you go do that search and it tells you even yesterday's mortgage rates. And then from there, it'll tell you where to go get it. And then you go directly to it. So SEO has moved from top of funnel, I think, to mid funnel. So it's not that SEO is dead. SEO of 2022 is on its deathbed. And we'll see what happens of SEO 2023. That's an interesting, interesting point there. I love, I love that, that um, it's more about middle of the funnel now. Kevin, what's your take? I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on the future of SEO and content. Yeah. I don't think SEO is on a deathbed. I much more see, you know, uh, you know, like it's sick. You gotta admit, at least it's sick. <laughs> it's always been sick, man. <laughs> it's always been sick. It's like it's being right. It's sick. SEO. <laughs> I love it. No, I think it's right now. It's in a cocoon. Maybe it's been a cocoon for the last couple of years, and soon there will be a beautiful butterfly coming out of it. And it's just you know, when you look back at the history of SEO, every five to 10 years, maybe eight to 10 years, you see this change in problems and required skills to succeed in SEO. And we're simply at a stage where old problems die and new problems come up and that requires us to develop new skills. So first of all, I think the transition to a standardized search experience where everybody sees generative AI results will take some time. Right now, the beta is pretty wonky, does some things wrong, not all the queries make sense. You can tell it's early. And that's good because fast shipping and unrefined products are signals of a company moving fast. And I love I want Google to move fast. That's great, right? They should they should be in competition with Microsoft. Um, but it will take time until everybody uses that and until it gets better. The much, much bigger challenge that I see for us is a loss in data. When you, when you look at the history of SEO, we've lost data subsequently over the last 20 years. First, keyword referral data, then um, more data from Search Console, which Google uh, takes out for privacy reasons, a bit hairy. Um, and so my fear is that we'll lose more data, first of all, because more users are using long tail searches, which gets much better for, uh, with, with AI. And then second of all, because users have conversations with AI chatbots, and I don't think we'll get all of the follow-up questions. So that that kind of um, change is, is, is a much bigger one in my mind. Same with keyword tracking. I think that's going to become really difficult. I really hope Google gives us more data, maybe in Search Console or a new tool or whatever, to understand how to optimize our, our sites. Um, and then the other thing is that this search generative experience, SGE, it's, I'm not sure if it will be that necessary to go to google.com anymore. Now, I think people will always do that. It's not going to go away, but it will fragment. I think search will fragment into different apps and experiences. And we got to taste what that could look like from the Microsoft Build uh, conference, where they introduced a feature called Windows Copilot that is basically a prompting engine in the operating system that allows you to to take action right so you can say turn my screen into dark mode align the windows next to each other or you know open my email tool um, but it will also feature search results and so i think we'll see fragmentation of search where sge will not just live on google.com but in the on the operating system level and you can just simply scroll down to your tab or go down to your taskbar and ask any question, and you'll get really good search results. And that same thing will happen in Google Car or Google Assistant or Gmail or your Android, right? So that is a that is my second worry: is that due to this fragmentation, we'll just will not have control over the experience anymore. We'll not know what really works well because search lives in so many different areas. So um, I, I'll, I'll cut it there for now. That's a, lot. That's a lot to take in. So much information. I really love you both for sharing what you think the future of SEO and content there. I think the other thing that's top of mind, I'd love to hear both of your takes, is what do you think about uh, how, do, how can marketers like really, and SEOs as well, future-proof their jobs from AI? You know, uh, I see you, Kevin, reading the book, <laughs> copywriting. <laughs> I, I feel like that's you mentioned it earlier. That's a way to, but I'd love to hear both of your takes. Uh, 
you know, Kevin, let's start with you. Uh, what, how do you respond to this? How can SEOs and marketers future-proof their jobs? Everybody's worried AI is going to take my job. And you're like, it's what you need to start thinking about to make sure you have a job in, a, in five, 10 years. I'm going to start by giving you a blanket statement that people are going to hate. And then I'm <laughs> going to give you two answers. The blanket statement is there's no future-proof job. That doesn't exist. Your job is never safe 100% or guaranteed or anything like that. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, you know, If you're the president of the United States, if you have your own business, if you're employed by someone, there's no guarantee for jobs. So you know, people will hate that because that's not, you know, people want to know how to increase their chances of staying employed. And so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be sarcastic here, but again, like a lot of people right now experience that even if you're employed by a big tech company, uh, your job is not guaranteed. Then out of the way. Um, you want to gain a lot of practical experience. Right now, there is a lot of movement, a lot of noise and chaos. And it is easy to fall into the trap of just reading headlines and taking someone else's opinion. And it is hard to gain your own practical experience and start thinking for yourself. But that's really what it takes to learn this stuff and separate between panic and reality. So that's number one. Like gain a lot of experience with all the tools, try them out, stress test them, and 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 find the questions here, right? So something that I've been doing uh, since you know November of last year, when all of this hype started, really, is I created a Notion page, I'm a big Notion user, and I listed all the questions that I have. How does this work? What are the most important LLMs? Who owns them? How do they want it? Like all these questions, and then you consume and you look for answers to these questions, and then those answers will stimulate new questions. So that is what it means to think critically. And right now, it's very important to think critically next to gaining your practical experience. Um, and then the third thing that I, you know, that I want to maybe add as a as a bit of a bonus is to look back at shifts in the, in history when bigger innovations came out. the re The reality is that almost every innovation led to a short term loss in jobs. And, but a long-term increase in drops. And I think AI will lead to the same. It's very easy to think, oh, AI can code for me. Like coders are going to lose their job. AI can design for me. Designers are going to lose their job. But the reality is that oftentimes the opposite happens where it enables more people to do that work and more people to do that work at a higher level. So now all of a sudden, you might not be limited by your ability to write Python. By the way, uh, my condolences to all the SEOs who tortured themselves learning Python, and now it can be done by an AI. Uh, but you know, now it's so much more accessible where maybe even I can code something like a small application, mm -hmm. but I can bring my own creativity and experience and different points of view to it. And that will, in my mind, enable a lot more people to, to, to do these jobs. So I'm actually long-term bullish, but again, it takes this stripping off the old skills and, and problems and op being open and learning new skills and new problems. Love it. Thanks for sharing, Kevin. Eli, what's your thoughts on this? How do you, how do you, how do SEOs and marketers future proof their, their jobs from AI? Yeah, I'm agreeing with, uh, with Kevin here that you can't future proof your job ever. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the most important thing you always have to have in your career is, is a growth mindset. So mm -hmm. be flexible and be willing to change and know that things change and adapt and see what's coming around the corner and not, again, cling to the past and say, this is the way it used to be and this is the way it needs to be right now. I think the job of SEO does change. Like I, like I said earlier, I, I think SEO is, is, is on its deathbed. The old SEO is on its deathbed. So therefore, if you're doing SEO of that old way, it's not going to work. And if you, you know, you can, it'll work for a little bit of time, but you can't continue to sell it if that's your job, full time job. You can't continue to do those things that work because they won't work anymore. If you know the click through rates of regular links are falling, so you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing. You're building links. You're creating content when nobody clicks it. It, that can't continue that long into the future. But I think there is a job for SEO. There is a job for people that want to help drive more results from organic search engines if the organic search engine changed. So that becomes the new SEO. I think the whole world is changing with AI. There's um, so a headline that, the, that IBM is hiring less back office people because of AI. And I think that was that's not a new thing. That's a trend that was continuing for them. If you don't need you know, people to go through 
accounts and go through uh, invoices and go through any any sort of back office thing because you could just feed it to an AI, then why would you hire people for it? So jobs will get replaced, but we don't want to just say, well, we can't embrace progress because it gets rid of jobs. That's not progress, right? Like look at the way today is versus the industrial revolution. People worked at factories and people did things that just we don't need to do anymore. Computers do them. We, they just don't need to happen at all. So we, you don't want to future proof yourself in your old job. You want to future proof your career that you have a new thing to do. So I think if you have an SEO skill set, I know that the thing that worked for me the most with an SEO skill set is understanding search, understanding the users. And obviously that's what I wrote my book on. We're like understanding the users who are using a search engine and how do you create something for them rather than SEO is understanding algorithms and here's a loophole in algorithm because the loopholes always change. The loopholes always get closed. Algorithms improve, but the users don't. I mean, the users change, but not like overnight. They don't suddenly say, oh, we really like smartphones, but now we like flip phones. There's trends, but again, the way thing, people are doing things, they, they sort of you know always just change slightly and you can keep ahead of that. So I think as a marketer, as someone that has doing SEO, you can really, fo again, focus on the users that are using search engines to find something and they will continue to use search engines to find something and you can continue to create something for that. The rules, of course, change. Like, like I said you know, a couple of minutes ago, it's now mid-funnel. So you're not creating top of funnel content, you're creating mid-funnel content, but you're still creating content for a human user. And, and again, like Kevin said, yeah, my condolences to anybody that learned on those skills like Python. You know, um, that's good. That's a good thing for the world. It's a good thing for the world. And I was talking to a Google engineer who said like, uh, engineering and coding is now going to go through this accelerated progress because you now know you don't need to write code from scratch or think about like, you know, even the no code world, you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to make a website, you wrote a website in HTML. And then you, then when you made a website, you just you installed WordPress. And now we're living in this no code world where you don't need to do anything. You just need to make a website and you have a great functional website. That's a good thing. So like, again, why should you have to write code from scratch? Why should you even content? Like, why should you have to ideate on content from scratch? Mm -hmm. We have now have tools to do it. So don't future-proof your old career or your current career. Think about like the skills you can leverage into what's coming around the corner. I love that. Thank you so much, both. Uh, we will be getting into the questions very shortly. But as I wrap up, I think Eli, Kevin, thank you. You're, I respect you both so much. I'm a big fan of both of you. I'm subscribed to both of you in your newsletters. <laughs> so... For people tuning before you do Q and A, go subscribe to their podcast. This episode a couple months ago was like, ah, it's so good. Google, watch it on YouTube. There's also Eli's uh, newsletter that um, are you prepared for the SEO apocalypse? I love that. I've also heard it, at, uh, yeah, phrased that way. So go check out Eli's newsletter, product.seo.substack.com. And Kevin just posted this up this week. Uh, you know, some of his observations from the future of SEO on his on this website, Kevin Indig. Dot com, but thank you both. We do have several questions already in the chat. So if you are on YouTube, if you're watching this on LinkedIn, uh, drop it in the chat and I will show it off on the screen. One of the questions that got brought up very early on is by Philip who asked, uh, how do you leverage AI to create content and to what extent? I'm curious what, how you're using even ChatGPT for the podcast or your newsletter. Do you, I, I'm, I can share what I do it from a podcast, but I'm curious how you both are using AI to create content. Yeah, should I jump in and you interrupt me, Eli? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Go, start talking. I'm, I'm ready. It's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, um, first of all, Romney, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure being on here and thanks everybody tuning in. This is a load of fun. To answer your question, there, I want to give you two examples and there are maybe three. There are many. Um, so first off, for the podcast, uh, something that we do is we export the transcript and we run it through a extension in Google Sheets or Docs called ChatGPT for Google Sheets and Docs. Very simple. You can connect your OpenAI API key and then just use ChatGPT to summarize, tease out the key points. I personally don't like seeking out timestamps. It's like there's a lot of tedious work. Um, and so I, I have, you know, we focus much more on getting a good title, making sure all the show notes are correct and links, all that kind of stuff. But we let AI summarize some of the plain things. So that's one application. The second one I want to offer is um, I have been using a, a, a an app called Poised, 
P-O-I-S-E-D. Um, that gives me live feedback on my screen for presentations, podcasts, all sorts of stuff. It uses AI to in real time analyze what I'm saying and then says, oh, Kevin, you're using a lot of stop words or filler words or you didn't sound confident here. You didn't sound empathetic there. So that's been big for me because I'm constantly trying to improve my, my, my communication, how I come across. And then, um, yeah, that's yeah, that's it right there. Um, and then um, a last one is there is a extension for Google Sheets actually by the Google TensorFlow team that is free. You just use it on your Google Drive uh, uh, storage or uh, space. And um, it basically allows you to use AI for simple computational tasks like linear regressions or like uh, forecasting. And it's called Meaning Cloud. Um, Sorry, it's called a simple ML for sheets. My bad. Um, and again, you can just simply install it. You just need an email to sign up. And then you can do very cool basic uh, ML or machine learning AI computations um, just based on your Google Drive storage and the data you have in sheets. You don't need to, to know coding or anything like that. Love it. Eli, do you have anything to add? How do you, how have you been using um, AI for content acquisition? <laughs> I'm not really using that much AI for content creation. I really like writing. And Ronnie, you also wrote a book. Like I like writing. So like every time I've gone on to like ChatGPT and asked it to yeah. write something for me, yeah, it's boring. So like it gives me ideas. It gives me like a framework of something I want to write, but I don't like it. Like, you know, some of my best posts, like I, I spit out like, you know, just sat down and 15 minutes later something comes out, an article comes out. But I use like Bart or chat GBT and it gives me something and then I'm like taking words out and then like, you know, an hour later, I'm like, all right, it's like, I don't know, polished, crappy content instead of great content. So like, I'd rather start with a blinking cursor than, you know, bullets that come out of chat GBT. Again, if I was looking for ideas, I think it gives me some good ideas, but I still have to write. So I've tried using content. I've tried writing, using AI to write content, but I don't like it. Like, I don't like the, the motion that comes out of it. I don't like, I feel like I'm editing someone else's work rather write my own work. Oh, you're on mute, Ron. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. It, it does, makes a ton of sense. Uh, I want to bring up this other question from Ayana about, we were already talking about this a little bit around the future. Do you believe that prompt engineering will soon be included in marketing education programs? And I'm guessing that means like prompts for chat GPT. <laughs> That's a little extreme. I can't imagine like going to business school and saying, here's some prompts you should use for doing stuff. Curious what your think is on that. Is that a little extreme there? Or it might make sense going forward. Uh, I guess, Eli, let's start with you. Kevin started the last one. So I interrupt Eli then, right? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> you go, you go. Yeah. I, I think prompt engineering is the, is the new know, everything. It's, it's a new SEO. It's a new marketing. There's no reason why you have to, again, start from scratch. So like a, a prompt might be, Again, you want to have deeper prompts. So you're, and you're chaining prompts. And I, I think that's a skill. That's a skill that didn't need to exist six months ago. And so it's a skill that will exist now. And you want to get better prompts because it spits out content. So you even think about like we were talking about the medical examples earlier. So you want to say like, um, what are what's a, what does it mean when you have a headache? So then AI will spit out what it means when you have a headache. But you want to really engineer that prompt and say, what does it mean when a 35-year-old female who has a history of something presents with a headache, then you get a completely different response. Or like the thing I said earlier, like Miami hotels, like, okay, come on, Miami hotels, that's a Google query. And I might've chosen something and clicked through, but a prompt actually now improves that process and say, give me Miami hotels that are within one, you know, one beat, one block of a beach and near a pizza shop and have a balcony and, you know, a club, right? Like something like that. That's a prompt. So I think that's a new marketing. And really what you put in is what you get out. And that's a skill the same way like, oh, I, you can't just know Excel. You have to be really good at Excel. Again, the, that, that I think prompt engineering is going to be a basic thing. And I, I would imagine it's something that shows up in, engin in like an interview. It's like, okay, give me a prompt that you give for AI. Either you do or you don't. And I think it's a really clear tell. It's like I've had um, interviews on SEO where like, what's the most important SEO function and i'm just like this is the stupidest question i've ever heard <laughs> so you gotta give a response because there's no right answer yeah. but i think when it comes to a prompt is like just write me out a prompt for this and either you can or you can't mm, interesting kevin 
I see so much potential in chaining prompts together. Mm. And it's almost like chaining APIs yeah. together, right? Where you, you could you could you could start with a you know with a basic prompt like <clears throat> describe the following image in as much detail as possible. That prompt is then sent to Midjourney or Stability AI or Dolly to create an image. And then you post that image somewhere and then you say, now based on the user engagement you see, change that image. That is not out of reach. It's not very far away. You can string basic APIs together to do that. It's not going to work perfectly yet, but again, the, the concept is in reach. And so when we talk about prompt engineering, one piece of the puzzle is to, to write the prompt in a way that your output is really what you want. And you can see the impact the strongest when it comes to images. Um, I've been playing around a lot with Midjourney, and you can see in this uh, in Discord where you you prompt Midjourney, you can see what other prompts uh, people use and how they what use what prompts they use to generate their images, right? So I often go out and I see like what image do I like, and then I copy paste their prompt and I refine it and I play with it and I see how it changes, and that's that's its own kind of world of prompt engineering and, and learning. But again, then this idea of chaining prompts together so that they can change each other is in my mind incredibly powerful because it creates whole new systems that we never thought would be possible and is in my mind the next level of chaining APIs together to get a similar output. Again, AI can add a, a, some sort of a layer of, of human context and human understanding. And as soon as we get more multimodal capabilities, meaning more capabilities across image, text, video, audio, et cetera, um, I think we'll, we'll we'll find a whole new kind of way of creating and tuning content, and that in my mind is a skill that's uh, worth learning. And the way to get there is to play with prompts right now and understand what of the what are the important elements that I can change, uh, and then automate in the future. I love that. I'm hearing both of you say uh, say yes here. You know, you start exploring prompts and like really trying it out. Love it. Uh, there's another question that came up actually that's uh, super interesting on LinkedIn. Kelly asked this question: "In uh, how will startups have a chance against well-established businesses in chat search? I mean, that's a challenge right now, <laughs> even for uh, the SERP at the moment. But curious if it's easier, harder, same, about the same for startups to challenge well-established businesses, or it's totally a game changer and they actually have an opportunity." to uh, disrupt the, the big players versus what it was before. Uh, let's start with, let's start with who want, I'm gonna start with Kevin. I'm going, I don't know. I don't All know. right, Eli, go we for it. We can't play this game anymore. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, yeah, Eli. So is that, I, I, I'm not really clear on the question because I, I mm. think the problem, like when it comes to search, there is no difference between startups and big brands either way, mm. because it most search is when like the reason that big brands are prioritized within search is because users want big brands. Like you want to buy, you want to buy something from a brand. Like let's say um, e-commerce, people want to buy something from Amazon because they know it's going to show up, they know it's going to be of high quality, and they know if they want to return it, they could return it. You need to build a similar brand. You can't just create a startup that again, like maybe uses third-party logistics and buy stuff you know, overseas, even if it's the same stuff on Amazon, you don't have the same brand reputation. So search just emulates that by promoting the brands. And again, startups don't have a chance. But if you build a brand, like, I don't know if you watched um, in the Super Bowl, Timu sells the same kind of stuff. They really built a brand because they spent all that money and then suddenly they elevated themselves and then they start showing up in search too. So those are just brand signals and like Google uses links to sort of accomplish that. When it comes to chat, it's the same thing. Now, search and chat is mid is going to be mid funnel. So, if you build a big brand and someone looks for your brand in chat, they'll find your brand. But if they just if you're just creating something that that is similar to a brand or is not a big brand or it's a concept no one even looks for, then they won't look for it in chat. So, I think it it's just a reflection of the way the world was and will continue to be. The only thing I'd call out there on startups and in chat is right now. The, the algorithms are very, very immature. So like I did a query the other day and I saw Google source a sponsored post. So it was like a sponsored post is, I don't know, it's like some weird site. It wasn't even a big media site. They got paid to write a piece of content. And for the FTC, they had to write that the post was sponsored because it was. And Google used that as a source. So I just think that's a very immature algorithm. 
that Google would trust as a source a piece of branded content that has no authority as you know an independent authority. So again, like I, when it comes to chat, it's very immature algorithms anyways, that they're just a comp they're taking in anything. So it doesn't really weigh into brands. And I don't know that you necessarily want to show up because Google scraping or chat is scraping the content and they're not really giving the traffic back. So same as before, be a, do big brand stuff to be a big brand. <laughs> Interesting. All right, Kevin, thoughts? What are your thoughts on how startups can compete against well-established businesses? Yeah, I want to add to those points. I do think brand is really important, but of course, you want to. There should be an entryway for new brands as well. I do think, just like in search today, that big brands have advantages, but there are also ways for up-and-coming brands to to build a brand, if if you will, or build a presence. And so, a couple of things. One is product reviews in e-commerce and local search have be are becoming so much more important. I played around a lot with SGE with the new Google search experience. And one thing that I found, which I also write, wrote about in this blog article that you mentioned, Romney, is that Google is able to extract key insights from third-party reviews, meaning reviews on sites like insider.com, Yelp, right, uh, Mac Rumors, whatever, like, like review sites or publishers, and turn them into structured data. So one example that I brought was you um, you look for a standing desk and Google is able to extract which standing desks in its top list of products are especially good for tall people, especially good for working from home, et cetera, et cetera. And these are not details or attributes that the, the merchant or the retailer has sent to Google. Google goes out and get that gets that information themselves, which is pretty stunning. So I have a you know a strong impression that getting good reviews and having a great product in the first place is going to be critical. So that's going to be kind of its own space. But then um, this other query that I tried out, which is corporate credit cards, mm -hmm. was really enlightening to me because you see that in this in the, in the new search generative experience of Google, right, the AI results, there's this carousel on desktop. It's on the upper right and mobile. It's uh, below the textual answer. You have a carousel of web links to websites. And what I found, which you can also see when you use the corroboration feature in SGE, meaning it breaks down the answer by the key points and, and where it got the key points from, you'll see that there are, I found websites that rank well in this carousel, but don't rank well at all in classic web search. And the reason was because they provided a unique angle. So for corporate credit cards, it was the risks of corporate credit cards, which no other web results covered. And this, this website that did that, or does that, they rank on number 26 in classic web search. And so to me, the way that, that the new brands can compete with incumbents is to understand what angle Google highlights in SGE and then see if they can provide a better angle or better information for this angle to potentially be highlighted in the carousel, get a lot of traffic, make a lot of money, create more content, et cetera, et cetera. I love it. Thank you so much. We are up to time. I really do appreciate you both. But I just want to call out once again. Uh, people check out uh, your Eli, your your newsletter at uh, productlightseo.substack.com. Kevin, your newsletter, kevin-indic.com, uh, which is Growth Memo. And then, of course, uh, sign up for your podcast, Growth uh, Contrarian Marketing. Thank you both so much. We are Everybody ask questions. There are some more questions that I couldn't get to. Yossi, Yossi Lee, I see you. But uh, we are up to time. Kevin, Eli, I respect you so much as marketers, as SEOs. You bring up so much, you bring up so much value to the marketing community. So I appreciate you both for doing this. Thank you. Have a great thanks, rest of your Tom. day, everybody. Thank you both. Thanks, Anton. Appreciate it. Loads of fun being here. And thanks, Eli, as always, for being a good thought partner. Oh, Kevin, you're the best. <laughs>